Well, hello. Hey, I'm so pleased uh, we get to be uh, together this weekend for uh, installment number two of this brief uh, December series. Uh, it's called Focus uh, for this uh, season, just a three-part series, and it will take us uh, through this weekend, next weekend, and then uh, lead us into our Christmas, uh, Christmas uh, services. Uh, quick, quick reminder before we jump into this uh, weekend. Next weekend, uh, Christmas offering next weekend, it says December 15, 16. December 15, 16 is next weekend, and one weekend a year, Year, we laser in on one weekend and ask the uh, regular attenders of Ada Bible Church, like if this is your church home, to carve out kind of a above and beyond, over the top gift to your church. And this has been uh, huge in the past in uh, anchoring us in financial stability. What comes in this, that weekend and toward the end of the year is just a massive uh, for us on the scale of the whole year. But secondly, uh, we get to choose an organization every year to serve. And uh, the organization we are serving this year is a group called Alpha Men's Center. Now, if you're cruising down D Division Street South, somewhere between Hall Street and Burton Street, you would pass a fairly unimpressive foundation of a building that is like this, but we desire to help that become this, Alpha Men's uh, Center. And uh, what Alpha Men's Center is going to do is it's going to serve husbands and fathers to gain skills, is to mentor dads and husbands in an urban context, giving them the skills uh, that they need. And so I'm excited about this project. It's exciting to help pay for a building, it's, but I feel like we're doing far more than that. We're helping them serve the men that they're gonna be able to serve through this. And so uh, this project really, really uh, excites me. And every once in a while, there's an organization that's you know, moving through like a major project and our church is able to step in and give a gift, an infusion of cash that just catapults that into the next uh, stage. And so uh, we look forward to give, giving them a huge gift over Christmas from the strength of our Christmas giving. And so once again, it's, it's, it's next weekend. I invite you to participate in it. And uh, I just wanna thank you uh, in advance uh, for whatever you're able to give to that, uh, to that offering. And so now uh, let's turn our attention to part two, uh, focus for this season, Christmas specials. Christmas specials. Uh, what are two or three of your favorite Christmas like TV programs or movies that you tend to watch a few times over the years? Share amongst yourselves. If you came with someone, go ahead and whisper to them what two or three of your favorites might be. All right, time's up. How many of you have watched a movie called uh, The Santa Claus? With Tim Allen, all right, hands up, watch Santa Claus, okay. Uh, there's a scene early in the movie with the Santa Claus. Uh, Tim Allen plays the role of Scott Calvin and his uh, son, Charlie Calvin. Uh, Scott has custody on Christmas Eve. It's late Christmas Eve, and he is going to cook this Christmas dinner for himself and his son. And so the camera focuses in on this beautiful, scrumptious Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, there's a turkey, there's all of the trimmings there, but then suddenly the camera pans out and you realize that you're not watching Scott Calvin's table, you're watching him watch TV. This isn't his table. This is a video on how to prepare a Thanksgiving dinner. Well, where is Scott Calvin? He's over there by the oven, putting out the turkey that is on fire. And so they end up in a car, Scott and his son, Charlie, and they drive, what, what restaurant do they drive to? Denny's, an American institution. And at the Denny's, uh, he looks around, there's other dads there with, uh, with their kids that kind of get eye contact together. They are out of the seasonal favorite eggnog. They are out of chocolate milk for Charlie. And he says, well, at least they have the hot apple pie. And the server, Judy, says, we did. And so the final scene in Denny, Denny's is with uh, Tim Allen just kind of opening hands out and going, this is nice, and it isn't. This is nice, and it isn't. And my friend, sometimes, sometimes there is this gap that exists, particularly around the holidays, between the ideal and the real. 
There is this gap that exists between uh, having our hopes up, having high expectations, having in our mind how everything's gonna go and how it actually turns out in the end. We showed this uh, picture last weekend of the perfect Thanksgiving. Everything in place, everyone in place. And sometimes life is like that. Sometimes for as long as three or four minutes. There are other times though, and listen, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Moving through the holidays simultaneously can be some of the great opp- greatest opportunity to hang out with friends and family and to experience joy and blessing. And I'm telling you, cruising through the holidays can be one of the loneliest, challenging seasons of the year. My, my take on this is that The holidays are a magnifier of our emotions, like like a magnifying glass. And and what can happen over the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas is that that the holidays magnify, they can magnify loneliness, they can magnify loss, and they can magnify disruption. The Holidays Act is a magnifier. And even as I mention that, I know that some of you are recalling the first Christmas that you spent separated or newly divorced, and this was not a divorce you wanted. You remember that season, or you remember being in middle school, high school, early college, and it was the first year of your parents' separation, and whatever word you would pick for that Christmas, it might not be the word ideal. The holidays magnify disruption. The holidays magnify, they magnify loss. If you lose a dear friend or you lose a loved one to death, the holidays can act as a magnifier on your pain and on your loss. I've uh, talked in the past about uh, the fact that I lost my mom when I was in the seventh grade. My dad was then left with five children. Oldest, my sister was 13. Youngest, had a younger brother that was two months old. So between 13 and and two months old. Uh, I lost my mom between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I was 12. Would you believe me if I told you that Christmas was strange that year? Because the holidays can be a magnifier of loss and pain. Three years ago last week, remember where I was driving on Cascade Road, it was between East Paris and Forest Hills Foods on Forest Hills Avenue. My phone rang, it's my daughter. I pick up the phone. She was expecting child number one. Her voice cracks. Everything okay? No. They'd got in for a normal ultrasound. Found out there were major complications the run up to Christmas for my daughter and her husband, the run up to Christmas was a litany of medical tests to try to figure out exact, exactly how complicated things were going to be. And the answer was very, very complicated. The holidays act as a a, a magnifier of our loneliness, of our loss, and of our disruption. And this is the reason that, listen, whether you are experiencing the best season of your life, or whether you're experiencing just a really challenging time, I invite you, I invite you into 25 days of spiritual focus. I invite you into 25 days of heart work. My desire, my desire for us is that we would open our hearts to God meeting us each and every day for 25 days, that because of the heart work that is done, we would emerge to be able to, to give our best, even in challenging situations, and that we would have hearts that are fully alive to God and fully alive to other people, even if this is one of the more challenging experiences you've been through in a long time. 
So each of these messages is going to have a, kind of a, a, a two-part outline. Uh, part one of the conversation each week is uh, taking a look at a story from the Bible that is usually connected to the Christmas story. And then the second part of our conversation is just to kind of walk through a journaling experience together. So hang on to your journal. You're gonna need that in the second half. And I'm gonna walk you kind of step by step uh, how to use that journal. But the first half, I just wanna open the scriptures, check in on a couple, see how God met them in their challenge with the sincere hope that their story will guide our story with the sincere hope that seeing how God met them would prompt us with a new hope and new joy as we expect how God may be pleased to meet us. So a couple's names. Um, dude's name is Zachariah. His wife's name is Elizabeth. Their story is found in our Bible in Luke chapter one. And the story opens with these words. Zachariah and Elizabeth, it simply says in verse six of Luke chapter one, it says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Well, check them out. Good, good, good people, righteous in the sight of God observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Good people. Uh, I don't think you would fear that Zachariah and Elizabeth would rip you off. If something, some gossip was being whispered about you, you're almost guaranteed that Zachariah and Elizabeth would not be the ones to pass on false information or to drag you down by sharing Embarrassing, heart-rending stories. Zachariah and Elizabeth, this is, this is the kind of couple you would throw your keys to, the keys to your house, and just say, hey, uh, could you check in on our place when we're away on, on vacation? That, that's the kind of people they were. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're the, the kind of couple that you, if you were going through a crisis or a tragedy and you said to them, will you pray for us? They would. Consistently, Zechariah and Elizabeth, both of them righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Yeah, anything else? Anything else we'd want to know about this couple? Yeah, one small thing the story tells us, verse 7, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. How does that make you feel? They're doing everything they know to do to follow God with whole hearts. And here they are longing for a child all these years. And they're not young anymore. The term that's used here is very old. They are way beyond that age when anyone would expect to have a child. Now we're told about their infertility in a sentence, but... That's not the way people experience infertility. Infertility doesn't happen in a sentence. Infertility is experienced through a long sequence of monthly disappointments. I wonder what events in their village held up a magnifying glass to their empty arms. F friends of theirs have kids. And all of a sudden, there's a magnifying glass held up to their lives that they're still waiting. Those kids that their friends have grow, and now their friends become grandparents. Going, you guys are grandparents. We were raised with you. You guys are grandparents. We're still waiting to become parents. And from the bottom of their heart, they can say, we're so happy for you. And you just kind of read that, righteous, holy, upright, blameless, and yet they did not have a child, and they are aged. And you go, man, is God shorting them? Is, is God forgotten them? And 
And then there's, there's a, an announcement, word that Zachariah receives that he's going to be a dad and that Elizabeth, his wife, is going to be a mom. Read through Luke chapter 1 for the fine details, but it comes as a shock. They are, they are unexpectedly expecting. And they're told to give this child that Elizabeth is carrying, they're told to give this child a name. They don't get to pick the name. They're told to give the child a name. Anybody know what the name is of this child that Elizabeth is carrying? Anyone want to take a shot at what that is? It's not baby Jesus. There's a clue. Okay, that's a different, different story. What is it? It's, it's John. You know what the word John means? John means God is gracious. God had been so gracious to them. And this kid, John, he's going to grow. He's like six months older than Jesus is. And when they are both adults, John will be known as John the baptizer because his job description was to help prepare the heart of the people for the coming of Jesus. The people would come. He says, look, you all got an apology They would repent and they would receive forgiveness and they would be baptized as a symbol of their repentance. And there's a day that Jesus comes and is baptized by John. It's an image here. It's it's, it's this famous, famous painting. It's by the Italian artist Pietro Perugino. There is John. There is Jesus in the Jordan River as John baptizes Christ. Now, the, the, the dad, Zachariah, he has a sense Not all the details, but he's got a sense of who this baby is. And the baby is born. God is gracious, is born. And when Zachariah holds this baby boy, Eight years, excuse me, eight, eight year old baby boy, you know, <laughs> eight days old. And Zacharias busts out in a song. He sings about the birth of this child. And the song is called by its Latin first word, the, the Benedictus. Last week, Mary's song, the Magnificat. This week, Zachariah's song, the Benedictus. And I'm so disappointed now because in just saying Magnificat and Benedictus, I've exhausted 50% of my Latin vocabulary. (laughs) E pluribus unum carpe diem mea culpa. That's it. That's, there's the rest. Benedictus, praise be to the Lord. Praise be to the Lord. Would you, can I show you Zachariah's song? Can I show you what this old guy holding God is gracious sings? I want to show you some parts of it. And just my goal isn't to highlight every detail of every verse, but just to kind of circle just a handful of things that, that jump out at me as I read Zachariah's song at the birth of John. It says, praise be to the Lord. And the expression praise be was the Benedictus part by which it's called. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he, what? Two words. Because he, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. That word has come means he has visited. It is a term that's used in the Old Testament of the Bible for God showing up, visiting his people with redemption, uh, to give freedom, to lead them into the next stage of their journey. It's like when, when, when God comes knocking. And so Zechariah goes, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he is about to visit us. 
through the birth of my son, but more, what my son, the one my son will prepare the way for. God is going to visit us. If we move on in the text, he says, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, first name in this couple of verses, as he said to the holy prophets of long ago, to show mercy to our ancestors and to, and to what, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father, Abraham. So here you get two names. The first name is, work with me here, David, David. The first, work with me, the first word is David. The second name is now, this is the deal. Abraham occurs at the very, one of the very first stories of the Bible. The guy says, listen, man, you just travel, leave your home, follow me, go to the place I'll show you. I will bless you unbelievably, and I will bless all the peoples of the earth through you. It says God is now fulfilling the promises that he made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of years ago. David came along a thousand years before the time of Jesus. It's David and Goliath David. And when David grows old, uh, the prophecies start to come about. Someday a descendant of David will rise up as king. This, my friends, Mary and Joseph in the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is called the city of David, loaded with ramifications that this one being born in Bethlehem is the offspring, the coming king from the line of David. But just the words he, he remembered. He's remembering the promise he made to David. He's remembering the promises given to Abraham. And then the next verse is here. And you, my child, just imagine him holding this baby boy and going, and looking into his face. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go, you will go, before the Lord, John the Baptist begins to teach first in order to get the heart of the people ready for the coming of Jesus. You'll go before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And John begins to preach in the wilderness when he's about 30 years old and calls people to a better way to live to state verbally what's messed up in their lives so that they might be forgiven and baptized as a symbol of their forgiveness. And then the final stretch of the verse here, it says, because of the two words, because of the tender, remember that God is gracious, named John. God is so gracious because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Two words, what, to what, to, to guide our feet in the path of peace. Now the image here, if you just, if you just slow down and read it carefully, the image here is of a pitch black, dark night where you stumble and where you fall and you can't see. And then suddenly, early in the morning, you look on the horizon and it begins to glow with the rising of the sun by which the rising sun will come from heaven to guide our feet, to guide our feet. And so Zechariah, what does he say? Let's look at the four expressions together. He visits, he remembers, he forgives, he guides. He visits, he remembers, he forgives, he guides. Who needs that? He visits, who needs that? People who feel alone. He remembers, who needs that? People who feel forgotten. He forgives, who needs that? We do when we feel we're beyond hope. He guides, who needs that? We do when we get lost. He visits, he remembers, he forgives, he guides. It's a beautiful song, and it is not the song I would expect. It's a beautiful song. It's not the song I would expect. I, I would expect Zachariah to pick up this tiny eight-year-old baby, <laughs> this tiny eight-year-old boy, and just... I, this is how I would expect his song to go. We've waited so long for you. You are going to be such a joy to your mother and I. We can't wait to hear you talk. We can't wait to see you walk. You have brought such joy to our old age. That is not where his song goes. That's the song I would expect to find. The weirdness of Zachariah's song is that it isn't about him. The weirdness of Zechariah's song is that it is all about 
what John will mean for the people, not just for him and Elizabeth. Zachariah's song is like God is working in us, but God is going to work through us, and God is going to work beyond us to touch hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives through this child. Zechariah is saying through his song, it's simply not about us. Is that a big deal? I think that's a big deal. But when you've been waiting like forever for a baby and you finally have it, to go, it's not about us. The blessed God is gracious. Zechariah, God has been gracious to you and your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God is going to be gracious through us. And God is going to be gracious beyond us. This is massive. This is huge, particularly when you're having to travel through a particularly nasty stretch of life, sometimes you go, yeah, what do you want? I, I just want to feel good. I just want to feel good for a change. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. But that's fairly limited, isn't it? What if beyond I just want to feel good, what if... What if God is pleased to work, not simply in spite of your pain, but what if God is pleased to work in and around and through your pain in order to bless others through you, in order to bless others beyond you? So as we start the second part of this conversation, we're going to work through a little journaling exercise together. As much as this might do to give you a sense of inner peace day to day, I, I, I don't think your inner peace is the ultimate goal. I think it's a good goal. I think it's an initial goal. I think that being blessed so that you can bless those around you. Now, 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 that's a reason to get up in the morning. Being able to say, Gracious God, work in me, through me, around me, and beyond me in this season. Now, there's a challenge. That's a reason to get up. So I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to grab, grab, your, uh, grab your journal. And uh, we've got a little outline here. I wrote day eight. Some of you who are getting this for the very first day, you can write day one. It's a 25-day challenge. Take it into New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. It will be awesome. Uh, I wrote day eight on mine, and um, gratitude one, two, three. Now, and what I would love for you to do is uh, I would love for you to simply write down three unique, specific things that you are thankful for today. Not my house, my home, my car, my kids. Specific meal item, specific interaction with another person, specific object in your house that you just really deeply enjoy? Specific clothing item. Take a moment, write down three things. Gratitude, one, two, three.
So, uh, 25 days. I'm going to ask you this for 25 stinking days. Three items, three items, three items. Why? Well, Jeff, so I can be aware of the blessings that bombard my life. What if, what if chronicling the blessings that bombard your life is a motivator? to being a blessing to others. What if you're blessed in order to be a blessing? Now, Zachariah's song, he says, God, you have remembered promises you made, and there were two individuals mentioned. The first person was David. Anyone remember the second name? The second name was David and what, what? Abraham. Yeah. I said this is one of the earliest stories in the Bible. God says, just move. I'll bless you in incredible ways. I want you to look at it with me. Genesis chapter 12, these words. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will bless you. Just do what I'm asking you to do. I will make your name great, and you will, what, last three words? You will be a blessing. All peoples on earth will be, what, last three words? Blessed through you. You do realize that when Abraham is told to move all of his chips to the center of the table and to trust God fully in this move, it wasn't simply blessing that would come to Abraham. It was blessing that would flow through Abraham. Let's move back to our list. Gratitude, one, two, three, as I do that again and again and again. As you practice gratitude, one, two, three, one, two, day after day after day, my hope is that you find yourself strangely freed to bless other people. I trust that the experience of writing that down, not just for a day, but day after day, would free your spirit to go, I am not empty, and I am not poor, and I am not alone the blessings of God bombard my life and that you find yourself freed. You find yourself blessed in order to be a blessing. And right about now, some of you are thinking, you're kind of going, yeah, Jeff, I got it. Dude, trust me, I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I am really, really thankful. But things are still messed up. It is possible to be a thankful person and still be still feel loss and still feel sadness. And so the magnifying glass, we go back to the magnifying glass, say, I'm working on this thankfulness, gratitude thing. This is still one of the most disruptive spaces we've traveled through in ages. So let's talk about that by moving to our next conversation. Gratitude, then then filling. And I would like to grab your journal again, and I would like you to uh, fill uh, fill in the blank. I'd just like you to write the word, today my heart is. Today my heart is, and then I would like you to choose one of those words that's there, or pick another one. Today my heart is glad, mad, sad, excited, afraid, ashamed, tender, or you can go other. Today my heart is numb. Today my heart is resentful. Today my heart, you know, I'm just anxious, like, you know, you can't believe. But just do a heart check for a moment, and um, can you do that, honestly? Today my heart is... because, today I'm glad because, today I'm afraid because, sad today because. some of you wish you had about eight minutes there. Can't give it to you. 
by the way, I found this list incredibly helpful. Uh, dudes, guys, if you are part of a men's group or three of you meet for breakfast once every Wednesday morning or stuff like that, and you try this ritual, just going like, how you doing? I don't know. Okay. How you doing? Uh, yeah, you know, it's a normal. How you doing? I would use that list. Glad, mad, sad, excited, afraid, ashamed, tender. Pick one. Pick one. I'm mad. Oh, okay, now we have something to talk about. <laughs> Being forced to pick one of those words. You know, I'm just excited right now, man. I'm just so excited about the future. I'm glad about the present. I'm just upset. I find myself upset. Pick a word. Uh, if you're in the habit of going around saying, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Uh, pick a word. It, I'm just saying, this is bonus today. Uh, this might accelerate the conversation uh, a little bit about where we are, what we're experiencing in life. Why is this important? Why is this important? Does this seem kind of fluffy to some of you? Is it just me? Does it seem kind of fluffy to some of you? How's my heart today? Today my heart is, listen, I need you to zero in on the words of Jesus. Luke chapter six, a key teaching that Jesus gave. He said this, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And he said this, for a man speaks what the heart is full of. Read that last line with me. Ready? For a man, for, excuse me, for the mouth. I'm sorry. Ready? Ladies, <laughs> you count too. Here we go. For the mouth. Ready? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I can guarantee you something. When you go blasting into your day, with resentful words, guaranteed you're speaking out of a resentful heart. When you blast through your day with impatient words, guaranteed you're functioning out of an impatient heart. Angry words, angry heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks pausing during the day and going, today my heart is. My friends, this gives you an opportunity to do some heart work before you plow into your day and inflict yourself on those who have the misfortune of coming in contact with you. It's not simply saying my heart is, it's my heart is. And asking God into that space to try to deal with that before I inflict myself on people who have the fortune or misfortune of coming in contact with me. And so I'm going to ask you to do another fill in the blank under, under filling. Dear Lord, please fill me with. And I would love for you to pick one of those words there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Try to find one that matches the first statement. I feel so afraid. Gracious God, please fill me with. Gracious God, please fill me with your joy, your peace. Take another moment just to write, dear Lord, fill me with and complete the sentence. Filling. Dear Lord, please fill me with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I, I didn't make up that list. That list is found to Jesus followers living in 
Galatia, Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he begins this conversation by saying the fruit of the Spirit is ask God to fill you with what you could never pull off on your own, gratitude and filling. Let's move to the last part of our exercise together, and it's just called identity, gratitude, filling, and identity. Who are you? What is more true about you than anything else? It's important, important question as you go moving into the rest of December. What is more true about you? Who are you? What is more true about you than anything else? I have an uh, image here. It's a, a map of uh, shows Jerusalem where the Jesus movement starts. This is a city of Ephesus. It was the city that was the trade mogul along the eastern uh, Aegean Sea in the first century. And um, Paul writes a letter to believers living there. In our Bible, it's called Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians. There's an image here. I, I love this building. It's uh, the facade. The building was behind it of the Celsus uh, Library. And there on the right-hand side is uh, the entrance to the Agora or marketplace. If you wanted to go to the mall, there's the library and there's the mall right next to it. And so just... Walking the streets of Ephesus just kind of like reminds me um, these were real people with real jobs and real flaws and real needs and real desires and real history and real baggage and real struggles. And in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he begins with these words right here, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, in love... He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his, what, last two words, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Why? Because he wanted to, in love, he predestined us for what? Key word, what is it? Adoption, adoption to sonship. What's so remarkable to me is that the letter to the Ephesians is like six chapters long. The chapters four, five, and six the Apostle Paul gives these believers instructions on how to live, on honesty, on, on theft, on their vocabulary. Chapters one, two, and three, it's like nothing, no commands. All the Apostle Paul does in chapters one, two, and three is say, remember who you are, remember who you are, remember who you are. And this begins with this term, in love he adopted you to sonship. And so with the word identity, I would like you to take a moment just to write out this expression, identity. This is, and just love you to write your, your name and gender. This is Jeff, your beloved son. This is Chris, your beloved daughter. Take a moment just to write that down. Take a moment to read it to yourself. Over the years, I've written that statement in my journals hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I don't do that to remind God who I am. I do that to remind me. At times in life, when loneliness gets magnified, loss gets magnified, disruption gets magnified. With those words, this is Jeff, your beloved son, I desire, just remember that I'm loved to get magnified. I'm treasured by the creator of the universe. This is Jeff, your beloved kid. He desires to visit you. He remembers you. He forgives you. He guides you. And this season, this run up to Christmas and the new year, 
He desires to work in you, but he desires to work through you and to work beyond you. So I would love us to pray just a three-statement prayer together. You're willing to play along. Part one is just, dear Lord, please work in me. Just so they say those words, please work in me. Ready? Please work in me. Now, please work beyond me. Ready? Please work beyond me. And now, please work through me. Ready? Please work through me. Gracious God, we would ask that this would be so. Meet us in such a way, fill us in such a way that your work would be powerful in us, beyond us, and through us. We recognize that we have been blessed to bless others. Carry us through this week. We ask this in the name of Jesus who came here for us. Amen. We'll see you next weekend.